In this summary of the Huberman Lab podcast, Dr. Andrew Huberman invites the legendary skateboarder Tony Hawk, who is recognized for revolutionizing the sport, creating new maneuvers such as the 900-degree spin. Dr. Huberman praises Tony's commitment, vision, persistence, and growth seen throughout his remarkable 40-year career. This conversation holds significance for the host, as he himself was a part of the skateboarding world and even had a brief encounter with Tony in his teenage years. The conversation begins with Tony reminiscing about his younger years. Tony was often placed in advanced classes growing up and considered a nerd, which he embraced rather than shied away from. He initially thought he would become a teacher because he understood complex concepts and could explain them to his peers. However, everything changed when he discovered skateboarding at the age of 10. Although quite competent in sports like baseball and basketball, nothing captivated him quite like skateboarding. Tony speaks about his early days in the sport, initially using it merely for transportation and following trends of the time. The Dogtown and Z-Boys era inspired him to try pool skating, leading him to visit a skate park for the first time. Not being able to enter one due to age restrictions, Tony finally got his chance to experience what he would describe as an epiphany at the Oasis Skate Park, breeding his passion for flying on a skateboard. Interestingly, Tony's dedication to the sport led him to quit baseball, even though his father was heavily involved in his local Little League as a coach. His father's support, however, continued through Tony's journey in skateboarding, allowing Tony to pursue his newly found passion fully. Tony always was passionate about skateboarding, drawn to its individuality and non-reliance on a team or coach. Eventually, he was able to frequent local skate parks and improve his skills thanks to the logistical support of his father. This marked a scenario unusual in the skating community, as Tony notes. A lot of kids get into skateboarding because it doesn't require parent involvement. Tony's father's involvement was met with mixed feelings. While he appreciated the support, Tony faced criticisms about potential favoritism from his peers due to his father's presence and control over events. He shares that in this phase, he grappled with these feelings but resolved to prove himself through his skill which can't fake. Originally, he was smaller and skinnier than most, even using elbow pads as knee pads. He felt a connect with the smaller skateboarders in the field, like Steve Caballero. However, his growth spurt at 17 gave him an advantageous boost in strength and height. As Tony says, I had these tricks, and then suddenly I had the strength and height that gave me confidence. The challenges and impacts of early fame are also explored. Tony turned pro at 14, and while there were not enormous financial gains at the time, he describes the time as one of pure passion for skateboarding. The notion of fame was a secondary aspect, especially because the professional skateboarding landscape was still developing. However, Tony does recall the discomfort of sudden recognition and attention, initially responding by withdrawing. He credits Stacy Peralta, the founder of the Bones Brigade, Tony's early sponsor, for pushing him to interact and adjust to his newfound fame. Hawk narrates how he carelessly spent his money as a nascent successful skateboarder due to his youth and the novelty of his earnings. He credits his father for championing caution and encouraging him to invest in property, an act he deems his saving grace. These anecdotes underscore a theme of maturity and fiscal responsibility that followed Hawk's youthful success in skateboarding. In the realm of skateboarding itself, Hawk discusses the criticism he faced during his early years. When he first joined the Bones Brigade team under Stacy Peralta, his unique style of skateboarding, which was marked by smaller tricks and technical board variations rather than big air, was mocked and dismissed as a circus act or robotic. He was often compared to other big names in skateboarding like Christian Hosoi, known for his flashy tricks and rock star personality. Despite the criticism, Hawk stayed determined and continued to push boundaries in skateboarding. He recalls that he was still only taken seriously once he started adding heights to his tricks. This growing acceptance leads to an interesting discourse about the importance of perseverance in the face of bullying and skepticism. Talking about the development of new tricks, Hawk's systematic approach stands out. He explains how combining existing tricks, taking elements from them, and testing if they can be synchronized into a new trick is how he approached learning. Hawk avoided haphazard methods instead, insisting on exploring the possible and consistently pushing the envelope in what can be achieved in skateboarding. 
The conversation resumes with Hawk sharing more about his strategy for creating new tricks, including how minute adjustments can make significant differences. At times, it has taken hundreds of attempts to perfect a trick just once, illustrating the incredible dedication and patience that skateboarding requires. Despite the challenges, Hawk emphasizes the joy of having a trick in his arsenal once it is mastered. Tony Hawk shares insights into the precision, complexity, and dedication required for performing challenging skateboarding tricks. He talks about his trick, the 360 Show 50 Focky, explaining that it involves landing on his skateboard's truck in a wheelie, or 5-0 position, and then continuing in reverse or fakey. Emphasizing the intense commitment needed for such tricks, Hawk remarks, It's so intense and it takes so much commitment, so much mind, you have to shut everything else out except this one moment. Often, inspiration for Hawk arrives unexpectedly in moments of relaxation or even during sleep. He says, Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll write down something because it was like, Oh, there, there's this trick. Oh, I think I could do that. This aligns with Dr. Huberman's explanation of the rapid eye movement, REM sleep stage, during which dreams can be incredibly vivid, but the body is physically paralyzed to prevent individuals from acting them out. Interestingly, Hawk shared how his skating dreams changed significantly after suffering a traumatic injury. Before his injury, he would dream he was unable to skate as desired, feeling as if the ramp was made of carpet. However, post-injury, his dream shifted to a regained ability to execute all his tricks perfectly. Dr. Huberman interjected with an insightful scientific explanation backing Hawk's change in dream pattern. REM may act as a form of trauma therapy. The brain is highly active. Dreams are intense. But the body can't physically react by releasing adrenaline, potentially creating a feeling of being bolted down. Further into the conversation, Hawk described his preparation process for participating in a recent X Games event in Japan. Falling asleep one night, he conceived a new trick, the half-cab body rail to backside blunt, inspired by the event's best trick round. For Hawk, the process of skateboarding is an immersive one. He focuses primarily on perfecting his performance rather than warming up, stretching or relaxing through techniques such as meditation. He prefers to gauge his condition with a set of basic tricks, a sort of initial run before delving more deeply into maneuvering more complex tricks. Authentically, Hawk emphasizes the joy of mastery and creativity in skateboarding. Learning new tricks or accomplishing something he's never done before brings him the greatest pleasure. He believes the beauty of skateboarding lies not only in the advanced tricks, but also in executing basic ones with precision. Describing how a well-executed backside ollie feels as good as any advanced maneuver. Dr. Huberman highlighted Hawk's independent drive to continue progressing in skateboarding, even when not being documented for professional purposes, reflecting on how essential intrinsic motivation is for anyone in pursuing a long-term career or interest. This transcends into Hawk's grit and resilience in overcoming his injury and navigating the ongoing journey of skateboarding. Hawk also reflects on his not-so-auspicious start in the world of skateboarding. He admits, contrary to what many may have speculated, he was not a natural at the sport, and his progression was more a product of his persistence and discipline than any inherent ability. He compares his initial experiences in the sport to those of Andrew Reynolds, a team member who started off sloppy but utilized the power of drive to become one of the best in the field. Hawk says, you have to give that drive as much, if not more weight, as natural ability. Dr. Huberman affirms this highlighting the many renowned scientists who thrive in their professions not because they are inherently brilliant, but because they consistently show up, work hard, and push through challenges when others may be inclined to quit. Later, Hawk recounts his experience with a major setback that threatened his ability to skate, a severely broken femur. Despite being a trick he had done thousands of times, a miscalculation led to the traumatic injury and a long period of recovery. Despite this, Hawk never lost sight of his goal to get back to performing 540S. The motivational drive was introspective, not external. It's not a sense of pride, Hawk shares. It's not like I have to prove this to anyone. I just have to do it. After an initial recovery where he underestimated the severity of his injury and suffered another setback by re-breaking the femur, Hawk made the decision to follow medical advice diligently. He adopted a disciplined diet, sleep schedule, and... Um, obeyed the mandate of two months of no movement. Hawk describes the significant impact of these changes, stating that once recovered, he could feel a night and day difference and was able to relearn tricks with ease in every session. 
But even now, post-recovery, Hawk admits that he's had to recalibrate his expectations, acknowledging that he can't push himself as hard as he used to before the accident. Certain tricks have become significantly more difficult. However, rather than viewing this as defeat or limitation, Hawk sees his ability to adapt as a necessary and valuable aspect of his progression as a skateboarder. Hawk's journey illustrates the powerful force that intrinsic motivation and discipline can have on our ability to overcome obstacles and push through life's challenges. Throughout the interview, Hawk emphasizes that it's not natural talent or even exterior motivators that truly determine our success in any field, but rather our mindset, our drive, and our willingness to continuously show up, learn, and persist through the hard times. In the middle segment of the informative podcast from Huberman Lab, Dr. Andrew Huberman and renowned skateboarder Tony Hawk delve into various topics, from specific skateboard tricks to the transformation of skateboarding culture, nutrition and health, the presence of skateboarding in the Olympics, to the impact of Tony Hawk's iconic video game. Tony discusses his struggles with some skateboarding tricks following a hip injury, revealing that he's currently working with a physical therapist to aid his recovery. He then reflects on the evolution of skateboarding, describing how it has shifted from an underground culture with little regard for health advocacy to a sport where skaters increasingly focus on their well-being and athleticism. Tony also takes pride on the progression he's seen in the skateboarding community, from being considered mundanely aberrant to becoming essentially mainstream, including its inclusion in the Olympics. Tony points out how skateboarding has always encompassed a broad set of styles and cultures, from competitive professionals who train rigorously to those who simply enjoy the thrill of the ride. He appreciates all aspects of it, admiring the diversity among skaters. Tony shares his views on how the skateboarding scene has changed over the years. Initially void of health-promoting tools or substances, it was overrun by fast food, cigarettes, and beer. But over the past few decades, skateboarders have started taking care of their bodies in the same vein as other athletes, fostering a culture that promotes resilience and overall well-being. Next, the pair move on to the topic of Tony Hawk's iconic video game. The game allowed kids who weren't physically ready to take on real-life skateboarding to experience the thrill of the sport virtually. For many, it has been a significant catalyst in breaking down the barriers to entry to the sport, inspiring players to eventually take up real skateboarding. Tony attributes the widespread acceptance of skateboarding to this catalyst, fundamentally shifting the perception of skateboarding worldwide. Tony grew up playing video games, which prompted his interest in the medium. His journey with the creation of his video game was not smooth, as many doubted the potential success of a skateboarding game. Despite the skepticism, Tony held on to his interest and passion for a skateboarding game, which paid off with the immense success of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series, revolutionizing both the gaming and skateboarding world. Hawk gives a behind-the-scenes account of how his popular video game franchise was born when Activision approached him with a prototype around 1998. Intriguingly, it was initially a modification of a game featuring Bruce Willis. After discovering that the game's motion and engine felt right for skateboarding, Hawk knew the game possessed the potential to be appreciated by skateboarders. During the year and a half development process, Hawk would receive builds on CDs, play them on a modified PlayStation, and provide feedback. Around the time Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was poised for release, he was offered a buyout of future royalties amounting to half a million dollars. Cognizant of the growing popularity of skateboarding, Hawk chose to instead forego the money and retain the royalties. This paid off when the game quickly received outstanding reviews post-release, leading to a successful franchise. Alongside his anecdotes about video game development, Hawk provides important insights into how he managed his finances during his career. In spite of his professional success, Hawk faced challenges in maintaining his lifestyle in the early 90s due to the periodic fluctuations of skateboarding's popularity. While giving Dr. Huberman a glimpse of his financial struggles, Hawk explains that he resorted to taking up random demo requests and worked as a consultant for commercials to make ends meet. He also shares his decision to take a second mortgage on his house to fund Birdhouse Skateboards, his own company, a move that would revolutionize his career trajectory. Hawk reflects upon his decision to not only be a rider, but also an owner and team manager, remarking that while it was necessary and sometimes exhausting, he enjoyed it on the whole. Hawk was constantly in the moment, 
dealing with everything from organizing demos to ensuring his team was punctual and professional. His understanding of the skateboarding world, coupled with an innate shrewdness, enabled Hawk to make pivotal decisions, propelling his career forward and establishing his legacy in skateboarding. Despite having many interests, including music, Hawk says that he kept skateboarding at the core of his life, unlike some who pursued different sports, such as Ken Block entering motor racing. Hawk considered other sports like motocross, but ultimately stepped back because he didn't want to risk injury and jeopardize his skateboarding career. Hawk talks about his recent knee surgery following a snowboarding accident and recalls it as a lesson learned about prioritizing his passion for skateboarding over other adventurous activities. He hasn't shied away from surfing and snowboarding entirely, though. While these sports were part of his upbringing, he doesn't pursue them as regularly, consciously avoiding any potential risk to his primary focus, skateboarding. He also mentions his experience participating in celebrity car races, one that ended with him totaling a car after a competitive driver rammed him into a wall. Hawk describes these extracurricular ventures as time-consuming pursuits that deviate from his main responsibilities, skateboarding, and family priorities. Hawk's dedication is notably revealed when he discusses his plans to skate at 8.30 a.m. on Father's Day, which falls two days after the podcast recording. Not only him, but his children, five boys who all love skating, seem to have followed in his footsteps. His oldest son, Riley, is a professional skateboarder and has garnered his own following. Hawk mentions how his kids have all found their own skate crews, independent of his influence. This independence, as well as their collective love for skating, brings immense joy to Hawk. He takes pride in being their chauffeur to skate parks and filming their sessions, a perfect vacation for him. The conversation further extends into Hawk's reminiscing about his parents, particularly his father, Frank Hawk, who both loved and supported skateboarding and his passion for it. Dr. Huberman shares his connection to Hawk's family from his teenage years, highlighting Frank's welcoming nature and how significantly it impacted him. Hawk talks about how his father would have been astounded to see skateboarding as an Olympic sport, given his love for competitive sports. Music holds a significant place in Hawk's life and continues to inspire him. As an example, he speaks of recently curating a playlist to amp himself up specifically for performing a 540 trick on his skateboard, suggesting that high-energy music performs a particular motivational function. He cites the strong bond between music and skateboarding, stating, that's what I associate with my best of time. It was punk music. He discusses the crucial role music plays in skateboarding, creating a rhythm and soundtrack to the act of mastering and executing intricate sequences. Gradually, their discussion transitions from music to experiences of high school, where Tony admits feeling like an outcast due to the resonance of skateboarding in popular culture at the time. Hawk chronicles feeling targeted and ostracized due to his affinity with skateboarding, emphasizing the rough nature of the 80s, a time when skateboarding was not as universally accepted as it is presently. The conversation then shifts to the evolution of the sport, and notably the increasing inclusion and prominence of women in skateboarding. Dr. Huberman and Tony commend the toughness and skill of female skaters like Lizzie Armanto and Lindsay Adams Hawkins, and acknowledge the difficulties they overcome in the traditionally male-dominant sport. Hawk points out that the necessity to have equal divisions for men and women in the lead-up to the Olympics had sparked a change where women's events in skateboarding are seen as mandatory, not optional. This, he argues, has significantly contributed to making skateboarding more accessible and visible to women, ultimately leading to increased participation. Highlighting the story of Lindsay Adams Hawkins, the first woman to do a 540 on Vert Tony recounts her triumphant and show-stealing feat achieved in Paris at the Quicksilver Exhibition in 2009. He emphasizes the awe and respect in everyone's reactions to Lindsay's victorious moment and notes how her accomplishment represented a significant milestone in the history of female skateboarding. The dialogue then merges into the realm of skating tricks, with mention of Rodney Mullen, who is credited as the pioneer of the impossible trick. Tony mentions him as someone he is still in touch with and admires. Hawk highlights the thrill of skateboarding's uniqueness and diversity in surpassing age barriers and gender differences. And this erases the boundaries and creates a community of communication and influence. One notable instance being when a 10-year-old girl suggested a technique maneuver for Hawk, further exclaiming um, the inclusivity of the sport. 
Hawk opens up about the darker side of fame, autograph vultures. He has always been open to signing autographs, especially for skate fans. Yet, in recent years, he has noticed an uptick in resellers who have no interest in skateboarding but only seek to profit from his signature on various items. Hawk expresses frustration with these individuals who have gone to extreme lengths, such as hacking into his airline accounts or buying unused flight tickets to accost him at airports for his signature. This intrusion has soured the experience for genuine fans, which Hawk deeply regrets. Hawk proudly discusses his non-profit organization, The Skateboard Project, which aims to develop public skate parks in underserved areas. He elaborates that the funding primarily comes from donations, fundraising efforts, and occasionally through specific fund allocations by other organizations. The project over the years has helped fund almost 1,000 skate parks. Hawk shares a personal connection, attributing his success and passions partly to the skate park he frequented as a child, viewing it as his home away from home. For Hawk, the importance of availability to his family presents itself as a foremost priority. The skateboarding icon articulates that he never had great career aspirations and that most were trick-specific. His aspiration is to continue advocating for public skate parks and progressing his foundation's work. As an unofficial ambassador to skateboarding, he desires to resonate skateboarding's positivity and cultural importance to the farthest extent. He admits that it's only recently he's come to appreciate the opportunities and enjoyment skateboarding has provided him and his family. At the age of 55, he's relishing the fact that he's still able to pursue skateboarding as a career. Acknowledging that many of his crew members are from the skateboarding world, Dr. Huberman expresses heartfelt gratitude for Tony's presence and the distinctive punk rock spirit he encompasses. Dr. Huberman not only recognizes Tony's extraordinary skateboarding legacy, but also commends the tenacious life gusto he inspires. His commendation of Tony's commitment to philanthropy is indicative of the insightful and enriching entities Tony brings beyond his skate skills, traits that are evidently nurtured by his parents. Dr. Huberman encapsulates their dialogue by affirming Tony's accomplishments and extending an invitation for future conversations. Towards the end of the episode, Dr. Huberman shifts his attention to the listener, expressing gratitude for their support and interest in the rich scientific content the Huberman Lab podcast offers, encouraging subscriptions on various platforms such as YouTube, Spotify, and Apple, along with his request for five-star reviews, denotes his commitment to extending the podcast's reach and impact. Dr. Huberman further showcases his dedication to empowering the audience by featuring accessible tools and resources from sponsors. Among these offerings are momentous supplements touted for enhancing sleep quality, hormone support, and focus, the Huberman Lab's collaboration with Momentus is a testament to his steadfast commitment to facilitating better health outcomes for listeners. In addition to spotlighting the podcast's accompanying newsletter, The Neural Network, Dr. Huberman establishes a link with followers through diverse social media platforms. Here, his followers can access more science-related content, some of which overlap with the podcast, while other contents are distinct, encapsulating a wider range of scientific angles. Check out the full podcast by clicking the link in the description below. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for listening to this podcast summary episode of The Pod Slice.